sex does not necessarily mean penetration and an orgasm. It can be just honoring your body. It can be a little bit of a dance, moving your hips, having a breast massage, maybe a couple of breast orgasms, and that's about it. Um, I have a lot of different guided audio practices for women when, where it's exactly this. There are so many different ways um, of experiencing this self-love and honoring your body and it doesn't mean necessarily an orgasm. And I think, you know, this is another kind of masculine and goal-oriented approach uh, that we bring to sexuality, that there needs to be an orgasm. Uh, there doesn't have to be an orgasm. Uh, you might even enter in an orgasmic state, or you might just explore the lower level of arousal. That's what I invite everyone to do, to play with lower level of arousal or with a medium level of arousal and stay there for longer and maybe that's exactly where you want to be in that day not higher mm -hmm. and when you're fully present and indulging in that medium level of arousal observe how juicy it is how beautiful and how it has different qualities of being horny and orgasmic it has a different depth and beauty Welcome, BB, to the Highest Self Podcast. It's so great to have you here. I'm so excited. I'm a big fan of your podcast, so it's nice to be on the other side now. <laughs> yes, and the first question I'd love to ask you is what makes you your highest self? What makes me my highest self? So I kind of want to give a twofold answer to that, okay? If I'm allowed to cheat a little bit. Number one, I would say being of service and helping people, inspiring people and being this catalyst of growth. And I especially love to empower women. So just seeing them blossom and uh, being a part of the journey is something that makes me feel my highest self. And then the second one that I want to throw in there is being in orgasmic states. And when I get into this state of full bliss, riding the orgasmic wave, so I like to say, instead of having an orgasm, I become orgasmic and it's extended period of time is a state of being, which is really, you know, it's magic, it's cosmic, it's divine, and you feel limitless and you feel connected with everything and everyone. And definitely that is the other one I will throw in there. I love that so much. And we'll get more into the energetic orgasms later on in this mm -hmm. podcast, but I had the pleasure of witnessing you orgasm. <laughs> which I can't say I could ever say to any other podcast guests, but I went to BB's in-person workshop in Tulum on energetic lovemaking. And you showed us your energetic orgasm right there. Mm -hmm. And I was like, almost like, wait, is that for real? But it was, it was so obvious that it, it was real. Mm -hmm. And, um, just your vulnerability of, of letting us witness you in that state. I think for so many of us, we don't even want our partners to see us orgasm, right? We're like, oh, what if I'm making a weird face or, you know, I don't look good. I, I look strange. So thank you for your vulnerability and showing us. And then also showing us that it's available without any form of self-touch. You are not touching yourself. You are fully clothed. Your Absolutely. arms were beside you. It was like a spiritual experience. And I had never mm -hmm. seen that before in my life. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, it's, it's interesting. And I started doing it because I have observed how powerful it is and how many seeds are planted in the subconscious mind when people actually just witness how the body responds uh, to the movement of energy. And even at one of my workshops, there was a woman who was over 50 and she shared with me that a few years ago, someone has sent her a video of a full body orgasm. She didn't even know what it was. She was not into conscious sexuality. But a few days later, she started to have this experience. And that is actually what got her into Tantra. But just from looking at it, there is already, there are dots connected in our subconscious mind. And actually, before I experienced my first full body orgasm, the teacher showed a video of half an hour of a person having a full body orgasm. And then I went into that experience. So this is my main intention. Uh, behind that. And yeah, I'm glad it inspires people. <laughs> it, it's so beautiful just to witness someone in that full expression, because yeah, it's like, it's who we are. Like sometimes after I 
experience an orgasmic wave in their mm-hmm. terminology. I'm like, wow, this is the truth of who we are. Like, this is what we're mm. meant to feel. And I'm like, how are we not doing this every day? Like, how are we so busy to try to make money and get success and get this and get that, that it's like, we have access at any given moment to feel the most heightened state of pleasure, but we're just like too busy to do it. So like what actually matters to us? And, you know, I think in really a lot of it is the sexual conditioning and trauma and shame that we have. And, you shared a bit about your story, how you were basically Samantha of Sex in the City <laughs> for your days, which so no, stuck was, with me. And every time yeah. I hear about your stories, like back in New York City, like I read one of your Instagram posts that on your 30th mm-hmm. birthday, you partied for 30 days in a row, like back when you lived in New York. And I'm like, I love it. That's so fun. So how did you go from Samantha of Sex in the City to <laughs> yeah. Contract Dakini? Yeah. So I was kind of, you know, I was, I always say I was in between. I was in between Samantha and Carrie somewhere, okay. somewhere there some in there. There some dramas in there too. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, and it's interesting because back in the day uh, when I lived in New York, again, I was in corporate life. I wasn't fulfilled. I was, you know, quote unquote successful, earning a lot of money, flying around, got my Rolex and all that, but was not really fulfilled. So I looked for that fulfillment in a lot of different things. Like we all did at some point in life. Is it, you know, partying, alcohol, shopping, traveling, and casual sex was one of them, right? It wasn't really meaningful. There wasn't really much connection. It was mainly a form of entertainment, I always say, and a form of validation. And often there was alcohol involved and often you didn't even know the person's name or they would never call you again. It was just really shallow, on a physical level but what's astonishing to me these days is that actually there was many times it wasn't even orgasmic and i would often fake an orgasm so i really asked myself what the hell was i thinking back then right but so that that whole lack of fulfillment um was kind of getting stronger and stronger and that ha- that voice in my head i couldn't distract it anymore with any of partying and traveling And it's kind of for the first time that I paused, I was over 30, my company sent me to Brazil and I didn't like anything about it. I really did not like neither the place nor my role there. So it kind of, I hit the the bottom. And once you're there, it's enough of a pain to make you start revisit where you really are in life. So that was a painful enough moment. I call it a mini midlife crisis where I really paused and asked myself, okay, what, what am I doing in this lifetime? What is my passion? What is my mission? And it was so overwhelming that, yeah, again, got me into my midlife crisis and I decided to quit. I embarked on my personal growth journey. And I think some of the stories we actually share uh, around that turnover, right? And once you start really your awareness journey, I believe that sexuality will Um, kind of pop up sooner or later in there because you're just going to start questioning everything you do right why do I do it how do I do it Um, what's the intention what's the quality of it what are so so sexuality came and I ended up on that workshop which I actually ended up almost by a coincidence or rather a serendipity and it was a workshop um, on using sexual energy as a healing modality. And my sexual energy had awakened. I had a full body orgasm. I didn't know what it was exactly back then, but I felt something happen. And interestingly enough, once that energy got switched on, it kind of remained switched on. And on that same event, I had a little romance, uh, flirting even, actually not a romance. We were flirting with, with an interesting man who had the same experience. None of us knew exactly what happened, but we started kissing. We were in our clothes and the energy started moving and we started having one full body orgasm after the other. And we just stayed experimenting with that for five hours (laughs) because none of us has ever experienced this before. And it was so powerful. It was so deep. It was so beautiful that we kind of wanted more of that. And we dated for a couple of months and intuitively played with energy and moving it. And when we split, I was like, okay, I don't want this experience to be dependent on that particular man. I want to continue to have this nourishing, energetic sexual experiences. So I started reading books. First, I simply started reading books. And because I was already experiencing it, to me, it seemed really easy. 
to connect the dots. And my, my, to my surprise, it was like, why is no one teaching us this? It really isn't that difficult. And just to you know, finish the long story short, I was so excited about it that I started sharing this with all my friends and talking to me about full body orgasm and how I shaked and what happened. And friends started to come back saying, well, you talked about a full body orgasm. I think I just had one last night. And I think after three of my friends came back, I realized that just again, talking about it already shifts something and already plants seeds. And that led me to giving those talks uh, that you attended in, in Nomade called Introduction to Energetic Lovemaking. And then I actually never planned on being a conscious sexuality teacher. It's, you know, it's, and I'm so happy because after quitting the corporate job, I went into much more feminine way and just going with the flow and looking where life is taking me and being present to all those signs. And people start coming back and more people started coming back and people started bringing friends and lovers. I remember one guy, um, a handsome guy, brought, came to my class five times. Every time he had a new lover, he would bring her to my class on one of the first dates. And it started growing and growing. And, and that's how it all started, really. So, so powerful yeah. and such an prime example of someone following their soul's purpose that it's not mm-hmm. like set out, but you were just like, this is so important to me and other people should know about this. So I can't help but scream about it on the top of my lungs mm-hmm. and that just naturally transitioned to you coaching people. And you're going to be doing a workshop in rose gold goddesses and working with people mm-hmm. individually and, and so much more. So there's so much I, I want to share. And I just I want to say, Sahara, one yes. thing that also thank you for you for what you're doing, because this finding my dharma, this is the most important, I want to say, event or moment or turnaround in my life. And this has changed everything. And, and I'm just and I know it's not easy. But again, I want to salute for what you're doing, because once people find this, you just really become a superhuman and just everything changes within and within your environment. And it's so beautiful. So just want to say that. <laughs> oh, well, thank you for being such a living example of it and such evidence that your pleasure can be your dharma. You know, it doesn't have, like mm-hmm. you being of service can be pleasurable and joyful. And I think so many of us, the old paradigm ways for me to help people, I must suffer. I must be a martyr, but martyr, but you're really helping people have orgasms and like experience more bliss and connection in their relationships, connection to themselves. So it's just such a beautiful fluid example of what you're just so passionate about oozing out of you and supporting other people. So thank you for being you. Mm -hmm. Now, before we get started into all the questions on energy orgasms, because I know you have them. So I know a lot of people watch that love sex goop show. I don't know if you watched it, the new Goop show. No, it's on my list. I almost started watching it, but I am leaving Tulum and the Wi-Fi went off. So yeah. it's on my list. And I know I know Sherry Winston and some of the Michaela Bloom, some of the uh, practitioners listed in the show are obviously, I read their books and et cetera, et cetera. So I know it, it is absolutely... Um, worth watching. (laughs) Yeah. So in one of the episodes, the guy has an energy orgasm Mm -hmm. and the teacher who is Miss Jaya, who um, created the energetic, the erotic blueprints. Mm -hmm. um, She said something along the lines of like, someone is eligible for an energy orgasm. So that made me Mm -hmm. think, are certain people more primed or more likely to have an energy orgasm or can truly anyone have one? It's just a different amount of maybe work to get there. My belief, uh, my what, and I what I have seen over and over again that we essentially all have that life force energy within us. We all have that sexual energy within us. Otherwise, we wouldn't be even alive. So it is a matter of learning how to tap into that energy, how to cultivate it, expand it, and then start moving it and directing it the way you want. And you know, since we all have that energy. I believe that we are all capable of that. Now, how long it's going to take you and, you know, is it going to be easy for some people? It's maybe going to be more challenging, but I have seen uh, people who have not even meditated or not been spiritual and they just had a huge breakthrough and and an energy full body orgasm. And I actually was interested in what my last lover who was not into conscious sexuality, who is more like a tech guy, 
Um, my intention was to initiate him and to see how easy it will be to um, kind of inspire and guide him into having this full body energetic non ejaculatory orgasm. And it took four dates. And on the fourth date, uh, he had 10 of those beautiful orgasms and it was actually a huge breakthrough from him. So yeah, I would say that we are all capable of that. So beautiful. Mm -hmm. So for people who aren't sure, what is Tantra and mm -hmm. what is Tantra in general versus Tantric sexuality? Yeah, so let's say because there are different, obviously different flavors of Tantra. And I think too, I would say that Tantra is the ancient spiritual path to the divine where we use sexuality as a portal for growth, for self-realization, for expanding your awareness. Now there are different, let's say, flavors of Tantra. The one that is more ancient and sometimes referred to as a white Tantra, where we focus more on the spiritual aspect of it and the expansion. And Neo Tantra, which is mostly what I teach, where we really tap more into that sexual energy uh, and sexuality aspect. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's the love that so mm -hmm. much. So really more so of this sexuality focused part would be under neo tantra and then the overall mm -hmm. spiritual practice of tuning into your desires as a pathway towards oneness or mm -hmm. tantra in general. yeah yeah i love how you rephrase that mm -hmm. yes. yeah. and there is just in general there is there is the aspect of sexual sacredness that we bring into sexuality there is aspect of mindfulness awareness and um, I like some people would say that Tantra is actually the new yoga because there is so many elements from yoga and we use intention, we use sacred space, we use um, meditation, we use pranayama, we use mula bandhas. And on top of that, we're going to use sexual energy that it's almost going to be like a fuel that amplifies those experiences. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Tantra, I feel is much more of the householder path. So for the person who did plan to be in society, maybe have children, et cetera, whereas yoga originally was for someone who was on a yogic path, which meant that mm -hmm. you were going to be an aesthetic and, and not be part of this society, which is why so much of it is based off of resisting your desires. So I think that in this day and age, what most of us are desiring is actually more of that integration of the worldly pleasures in life with more awareness. Absolutely. And I would say in yoga, we the sexual desire, sexual energy would be a little bit more suppressed while in Tantra, we really see it as natural, it's sacred and something that we want to embrace. Mm -hmm. So for someone who feels like, well, I feel like I have a really low sex drive. I feel like I'm not really that interested in sex. Do you think certain people are just born like that? Or do you think that there's some repression or shame that's blocking the sexual energy from flowing? Mm -hmm. So definitely there are different reasons for that. And obviously some people will have a higher libido in general, and some people will have a lower libido, but then there are other things like our lifestyle, stress level, general energy level, right? If you are conscious, if you are continuously working hard, tired, and stressed, then obviously you're going to have less desire. Um, so that uh, now what I believe a big part of it is that we don't really tap into full potential of sexuality. And some teachers like to call it, call it, we kind of almost have this junk food sex rather than having gourmet, farm to table, organic sex. And let's be honest, the junk food sex is not that nourishing, it's not that exciting, it not, is not um, something that, you know, especially a lot of women who don't, most of us don't even experience vaginal type of orgasms, um, we might lose interest after a while. So to me, one of the big reasons for that is that we never tapped into that soul nourishing, you know, divine, expansive type of sexuality. Because I have seen over and over again, that once people, and especially women, once they do tap into that, it's actually them wanting to have more sex. And that's definitely has been my case as well than their partners. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So true, because if all you've experienced is sex that you're not even having an orgasm, you're, you're just kind of doing it to satisfy your partner. Of course, you're not going to want to do that. And then you might label yourself as, oh, I just have low libido, but it's just like, you're just doing something you don't like. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, so if sex on average, I think there's different research, but in sex on average lasts about four minutes, penetration lasts four minutes. And it's a little bit of a slam bam. Thank you, mom. Uh, it's just simply not that exciting. And also another reason to that, because I actually, in my online courses for women, when they're one of, one of the reasons women come with is, oh, you know, I haven't had a partner for a while and I kind of almost forget about sex and I'm not even really drawn to that. So what you don't use, you lose, right? So it's really also up to us to cultivate that sexual energy and in the moments that I am single and I don't have a lover or I don't have a partner I still have my conscious high vibration masturbation or self-pleasure self-love ritual scheduled at least once a week for an hour in my calendar and I show up and it doesn't matter sometimes I will be tired I will be stressed I will not be in the moon but I am creating that space and it is always I say similar to a yoga class Sometimes you will have to get up in the morning and you won't be really in the mood to go to a class, but you're going to show up, you're going to go there and you're going to feel absolutely lighter, relaxed and amazing after the class. So similar here, you're going to show up for your self-pleasure practice. You're going to honor your body. You're going to cultivate, you're going to ignite that fire within you. And this will kind of bring more of that um, more of that openness and willingness to explore with sexuality. Mm, so like. good. And I know you have this beautiful self-pleasure altar in your home. <laughs> can you share a little bit about how we can make an altar like this? Cause I feel like that's just such a great reminder in your day of what, what's valuable to you. Absolutely. And you know, altar just brings so much more sacredness and intention. Uh, and what do I have on my altar? Uh, apart from all the things that we like to put in the altar that are meaningful for us, so it can be drawings of a goddess, it can be crystals, candles. On top of that, I also have all things pleasure and sense, senses related. So I want to bring sensuality. So I do have feather to work with the touch. I do have all kinds of essential oils and rose water and spray for the sheet. So I want to bring in the sense of smell. Uh, then I also have a lot of coconut oil, again, touch and something that I use a lot in my self-pleasure practice. So bringing all this sensuality tools. Uh, and then obviously my jade egg, my collection of crystal wands. And how amazing, because both the jade egg and the crystal wands are from crystals. So they perfectly fit into what I call a pleasure altar. And a lot of candles, because again, that will play with a sense of sight. So just, I would say a lot of elements that you normally have in your altar, but then bringing in more senses and more things that come, that, that are related to pleasure. I love that. So beautiful. So I want to talk about vibrators because for mm -hmm. a lot of women, their self-pleasure practice is. I have 10 minutes, let me grab my vibrator and do the thing that I know I can do to make me finish as, as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. I know there's varied opinions on this. Some say, you mm -hmm. know, if the vibrator is making you orgasm, that's the only way keep doing it. Mm -hmm. Other people say it's actually desensitizing your clitoris and yeah. make you kind of more numb and less likely to have these energetic orgasms. What's your take on it? Yeah, so I first wanna say that there's no consensus on it. And there are so many opposites uh, you know, opposite opinions on that. And some people say, no, absolutely go for it. It's not true that it desensitizes the clitoris. Some others say the opposite. So I will express my own personal experience and my own personal opinion. It's not an absolute truth, but from what I have experienced with my own body and with so many clients that I work with, clitoral uh, vibrator was not really something I would recommend for a few reasons. Number one, it brings you in what you just even expressed in that fast food mindset. You don't really have to warm up your body. You don't really have to breathe. You don't really have to move. You don't have to take time to connect to your body. You just put 
Um, you just put a device that does it all for you. Uh, so for me, it takes away the sacredness of the experience that it also really um, kind of makes it so fast I don't even think 10 minutes. I think 10 minutes with the vibrator, it's probably, you know, I would say maybe two or three <laughs> or somewhere along those lines, right? So it's not really that we're going to be, you know, moving the energy or fully um, indulging in that uh, bodily experience and riding the wave of pleasure. It's again, slam bam, thank you, mom. But this time we are just using a vibrator. Now, to me, the way we, may, we have love with ourselves, the way we make love to ourselves sets the tone for our lovemaking style with a partner. So if we're just using a vibrator, doing basically nothing, being completely passive, having the device for two minutes and that's it, then that's going to set a tone for the way we have sex with our partner that will be fast, that will be mainly clitoral oriented, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I have many clients who shared with me that they indeed were feeling less and less. And I remember one of my clients was laughing that first she was using a speed one, then she had to move to speed two. And when we talked, she was on speed three and she was concerned because there was no number four on her vibrator. <laughs> and many of women who are addicted to vibrators also uh, share with me that they have a trouble even feeling a penis inside of them. And true, penis will never vibrate at that speed. Neither your hand will vibrate at that speed. So I would say if you wanna use vibrators, I would probably recommend the G-spot vibrators rather than the contorial one. And to me, I just also want to invite women to go beyond the clitorial type of orgasm, which is great, which I really like and enjoy myself as well. But I always say I like to compare it to an appetizer. And don't get me wrong, I love appetizers, but I also want to experience delicious main <laughs> dish and delicious desserts in my life, not just always stay with the appetizer. So this will also take away the focus of just always going for the clitoral type of an orgasm. So that's my personal opinion and my personal experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think of it like a massage tool, right? Like there's like mm -hmm. those Thera guns and stuff, but it's like no masseuse's hands are going to be able <laughs> to go that fast and that hard, like a Thera gun massage machine. Again, maybe if you have like a kink in your neck and you need to do it, then do it. But I think it's like the habit that most people I know who, who use vibrators, I myself do not use them, but people I know who mm -hmm. use them, it's like, they, they need it more. Maybe they need it as like a daily habit. It's like this mm -hmm. nervous, nervous habit they have. Even they use it in sex because they can't orgasm in sex I'll without yep. the vibrator. So it's like, again, I'm all for women having orgasms. Mm -hmm. And it's like, then how are we going to take off the training wheels? You know, it starts yeah. somewhere. And then sometimes exactly. it's just like, you know, and, and I feel, I know we've had conversations of like, so many women are like, but I deserve to orgasm. Like I deserve pleasure. And if I take this away, then I'm not going to have it, but it's really building those neuro pathways for you to experience it in a greater way than you already are. But the only way you're going to do that is to like kick the habit so you can actually desire this greater thing. Absolutely. And, you know, I think that also what's important to mention that I think one of the challenges in our society is the overstimulation. And it comes in every possible form. And to me, that's a little bit of an expression of that and using the vibrators that we just need so much stimulation and overstimulation to feel anything. And, and I always say to women who are using the vibrator, when you at the beginning going to uh, put their vibrator away, there will be a dull and boring period of time because you are not going to experience that intensity anymore, what, what you're used to but you don't have the sensitivity yet to really perceive the subtle sensations. And it's gonna take time. And the more you're gonna stay with this discomfort, you're not gonna run away, you're not gonna distract yourself, but you're gonna stay every time you're gonna feel a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. Now to everyone, I would say much better alternative, again, in my experience and from the clients that have worked with me and hundreds of them, uh, holistic tool, which is crystal wands. And I will tell you, Sahara, over and over again, women in my courses, first they ask, do we have to use the wands? I get this question a lot, but can we join the course and not use the wand? 
And then while we do the last call and favorite moment, more than half of the women say the first practice with the wand. Where the hell was I? Why was I never introduced to the wand before? It is so powerful. It is so magical. So I really, really invite women to explore the wand and vaginal type of orgasms. Do you think that before using the wand, one should get more acquainted with their finger to kind of like build that mind-body connection? So I actually, in my courses, first even teach um, our anatomy and how you can really play, massage, and activate all the pleasure points outside of your vagina. Because this is even the area we don't know and we don't understand. And there are so many powerful, beautiful pleasure points and so many different glands and so much of the erectile tissue that we can stimulate and massage. So we women actually can have our own erection before we even go anywhere near the entrance of the vagina and inside of our vagina. So I actually start there. And to be more precise, I even start step before, which is our breasts. Before we even go near our genitals, start with the whole body, breasts, then your vulva outside and only then finger and then essentially later on um, the wand. So that's the exact <laughs> path that I like to follow. Mm, I love that. And can you speak a little bit about how the breasts for women are our positive pull mm -hmm. while the penis for men is their positive pull? Yeah. So I like to explain Laying it very easily because you can even see how our genitals look like, right? For men, it is the penis that literally I say sticks outside and men penetrates the world, impregnates the world with his penis. And that's his positive pole. That's where the energy builds up and there where, it's where he gives the energy from. Now for us women, if you look our vagina, it is a receptive part of our body. We receive inside of our body, but which part of the body literally sticks outside? How do we women penetrate the world, right? It's the breast. We nurture from here. We radiate from here. We give love from here. This is how we go to the world. And this is our positive pole. And you will read in you know, a, lot of, uh, a lot of texts that, and, and I totally resonate with that, that heart is really the gateway to a female sexuality. And the breasts are the closest erogenous zone to the heart. So we really want to open. It's not just the breast. We just want to open this whole area. And this area, how Mother Nature is so genius, right? Because our nipples are connected to the endocrine system. So when stimulated, we release bonding hormone, feel good hormone. We relaxed, right? So when the baby is sucking the nipples, we really bond and create that special connection with the baby. But the same is the case when our partner uh, stimulates the nipples, right? And we actually can even have breast gasms. And to me, this was probably one of the biggest discoveries of this, on this journey, how powerful the breasts are, how orgasmic they are, and how they completely change the experience of sexuality, how they open your yoni, how they open your heart, how, again, beautiful, orgasmic, um, that experience of stimulating the breast can be. Mm. And it's so important to know this difference because for a man, you can kind of just like start touching their penis, like pretty immediately, right? Like mm -hmm. they might be just like ready to go as long as they're there mentally, of course. Whereas for a woman, if you just like start touching her vagina, it's like, oh, like get away from me. Like, I don't feel ready for that. So it's so important mm -hmm. to start with the breasts and open up the body in that way. Um, otherwise it's like someone coming near you too soon can actually make you close up even more. Absolutely. And I would even say, we call it indirect approach when it comes to female bodies. So we actually, even before going to the breasts, you can play with the hair, you can play all the other erogenous zones that we often forget about. The ears, the neck, the wrists, those are all juicy erogenous zones. So we wanna activate that. And then we're gonna go around the breasts, right? And only then we're gonna approach slowly the nipples, which are the most erogenous part of that area. And then we're gonna go to a lower belly, the inner thighs. Then we're gonna go to outer lips, inner lips. And the last thing we do, we're gonna approach the entrance of the vagina. And since our vagina is a temple, 
I like to say we're going to ring the temple bell before we enter. And I teach women in my courses to tune into with themselves is my vagina open and ready to be penetrated? Is it during a self pleasure if you are inserting an egg or, uh, or a wand? Or are you with a partner? I absolutely teach my partners to ask that question. And it's so beautiful and it really changes everything. So that's uh, indirect approach, as yeah, you that's mentioned. That's such great advice to a question I had, which is like, sometimes as women, we're intermasculine, we're, we're working, or you might be taking care of kids and you're just not in your receptive state. So mm-hmm. sometimes I feel like I've like put pressure on myself of like, oh, I should, you know, have more self-pleasure and like, you know, be more in my orgasmic practice, but it's like, I'm not energetically there yet. So I feel like this indirect approach, it gives you so much more permission. It doesn't mean like, oh, if I have a night of self-care, I need to masturbate. It could just be, you just touch your breasts and like that can be your self-pleasure practice. Well, Sahara, you you nailed it, nailed the point with this comment because this is exactly what I so often say. And it's both in relationship to self-pleasure and sex with a partner. Sex does not necessarily mean penetration and an orgasm. It can be just honoring your body. It can be a little bit of a dance, moving your hips, having a breast massage, maybe a couple of breast orgasms, and that's about it. Um, I have a lot of different guided audio practices for women when, where it's exactly this. There are so many different ways um, of experiencing this self-love and honoring your body And it doesn't mean necessarily an orgasm. And I think, you know, this is another kind of masculine and goal-oriented approach uh, that we bring to sexuality, that there needs to be an orgasm. Uh, There doesn't have to be an orgasm. Uh, You might even enter in an orgasmic state, or you might just explore the lower level of arousal. That's what I invite everyone to do, to play with lower level of arousal or with a medium level of arousal and stay there for longer and maybe that's exactly where you want to be in that day not higher Mm -hmm. and when you're fully present and indulging in that medium level of arousal observe how juicy it is how beautiful and how it has different qualities of being horny and orgasmic it has a different depth and beauty to it Mm -hmm. yeah it's such a beautiful feeling to just be like open and like turned on, but like living your life from that place. Whereas some of us were just zero to a hundred of just like, we're work, work, work. Okay. Self-pleasure. Okay. Back to work, but just like living, like sometimes me and Steven joke of like, we should always be like one touch away from orgasming and live our lives like that. (laughs) And just like to live in that just like open juicy state where you're, where you're playing with life. But a question I have for you is what is your advice for women who feel like their breasts aren't sensitive? They don't really feel anything when they touch or a partner touches their breasts. Yeah. And there's definitely a lot of women that are going to resonate with that. And there's so many reasons from that. Number one, and I actually, so many women are in this spot, Sarah, that I, that I um, created a course that specifically uh, addresses that. And it's called Orgasmic Embrace. And let's just say that about 71% of women don't like their breasts. 71% of women. So how do you want to feel pleasure in your breasts? How do you want to have orgasmic breasts if you don't even like them in the first place, right? So it already starts with that body acceptance there. Secondly, a lot of women lose sensitivity because of implants. And I don't think the information that is given to women is really you know, truthful. Uh, most women think there is very little risk from what I have seen and a lot of peers in my business, again, there is no research on that, but you know, at least half of women are losing in some way sensitivity. Now, another reason for that is the conditioning uh, around breasts and also the way we stimulate them, which is often coming from pornography. And there's a lot of biting, squeezing, and let's be honest, breasts are really sensitive. There's about 800 um, nerve endings in the nipples. So we want to be gentle. And when we come to stimulation, when we talk about breast stimulation, it's not just the nipples. It's this whole area that we really want to massage and we want to be gentle and slow and explore with different type of touch and different speed and different pressure. So I would say start with self-breast massage. Even if it's two or three or four minutes a day, you can do it as a part of meditation. You can do it under the shower start connecting to your breasts. 
start having a relationship with your breasts because let's be honest what we don't use we lose again so if you never really played with the breasts there is little awareness there's little connection to this part of your body the more you're going to start practicing connecting to the, that part it's like a you know piano player or guitar player the more they use their fingers the more sensitivity there will be right the more space in your brain that part of the body will get so start connecting start massaging without any agenda without any expectations mm. and keep this practice and you will see slowly and slowly there will be more sensations there will be more happening and trust me i had so many women who came to me and said i don't like my breasts to be stimulated i don't even like my breasts and then they become breast gasmic and again if you want to dive deeper my uh, orgasmic embrace course is exactly about that Mm, I love that so much. And again, that reminder of treating yourself like the lover that you wish that you had that maybe you're like, oh, my partner doesn't even take time with me, but you taking time with yourself will show your partner because then when you are in um, sexual relation, you can be like, oh no, this is how I like to be touched. And that's also really sexy too. a woman that knows how she wants yeah. to be touched. Cause most men are just doing what they think women like, like they just watch porn and they think, Oh, women must all love like nipple clamps and like being bit and like being spanked and all this stuff. And again, some <laughs> like that and some might not. Um, exactly. and I think also trying different styles of sex that maybe you guys are in a routine that you have sex in the same type of way, but trying something that's a little bit more slow and, and sensual. So do you have any tips on how to bring your partner into this. If you guys have always been having sex for the same time, maybe you feel some like shame or embarrassment about even like bringing this up. How can we bring more sensuality into our sexuality? Mm -hmm. And this question actually is asked so often. And I even had some posts on my Instagram giving people exact phrases they can use. So I want to share the following here in this podcast. Number one, just do it because more often than not we are assuming that the partner will say no we are assuming that the partner is interested without even trying so first give it a try now i would i would kind of um approach it from the possibility and opportunity angle so i wouldn't say hey we always have sex the same way it's boring i will i don't want it do it this way anymore i want to do something else right because then you're criticizing you're putting someone down and it's it's a negative motivation i would approach it from a positive motivation angle which is hey i just heard a podcast with sahara rose they talk about conscious sexuality and how we can experience all these energetic orgasms how we can dive so much deeper how there's so much pleasure and new things to explore and I am so interested and you are actually the only partner I ever had that I even bring it up to because normally I wouldn't even feel comfortable, but I feel you're open-minded. I feel you're curious and I feel safe with you and I would love to explore and expand and have those beautiful experience with you. Would you be open for that? <laughs> how does that how does that sound Sahara I love would that you say so yes much to that because it's, yeah it's like who would say no to better sex no one exactly. like everyone would say yes to that I think it's just especially as women maybe our internal shame of I shouldn't be the one to bring up these conversations I shouldn't be the one to initiate sex because that makes me a slut and all of these mm -hmm. programmings that we have so I think it's you know releasing that and how is someone supposed to know what we want if we never share it or you know experience it with them and I think that's the issue with so many women faking orgasms like you mentioned it's like how is that partner supposed to know what's actually going to make you orgasm if all you've been doing is faking it and maybe it's weird if like one day you stop faking it but it's like some, at some point you're going to have to take off the mask and be like, Hey, actually what I would really love to try is this. So a question that I definitely had was how do you, when sexual energy is building up and maybe your like body is like, it's almost like pointing you in the direction of orgasm. Mm -hmm. How do you 
resist that because it feels like such a biological reflex that our bodies like want to orgasm because it's like related to procreation. And so much of, of Tantra is to breathe through that and to ride that wave rather than letting it pour over. And, and can you explain a little bit like the difference between riding the wave versus having the orgasm? Mm -hmm. So what I would say here is, so it's not obviously, we, we don't want to punish ourselves if we orgasm. I don't, again, would not want anyone to have this kind of approach, but the orgasm doesn't become like an end goal that we are obsessively chasing. It's, it's a bonus. It's a chair on the top. It's something that we invite and it ha happens almost as a byproduct of the rest magic that we are creating. Okay. So I would say the following here, I would slow down. Because Sahara, if you slow down and if you're going to start playing with the lower level of arousal, and I always ask people to start observing where they are with their arousal level from a one to 10, one not being aroused at all, 10 having an orgasm. Let's play with the six, let's play with the seven, and let's stay there and let's even play with the free. Let's be honest, let's start a four play, let's play with the free for 20 minutes and then let's play in the rounds of five for another 20 minutes okay and then six and then let's enjoy just every level uh every next level we go on to so then by the time you get to you know for what a man is called a point of no return you've already been riding the wave for two hours okay so to me slowing down and enjoying really lower level of arousal now what will help you with this apart from slowing down is being less in your mind so not so much fantasies and etc but being more on in the sensations in your body what will also help you is breathing so if you're going to start breathing deeper and it's longer slower deeper breaths this will help you to slow down again, and it will help you to distribute this arousal away from the genitals and all over your body. Then relaxing is another thing. You want to relax on every exhale, relax your genitals, relax your whole body. And this will actually also allow you to distribute this energy all over and again, ride the wave. Because observe that, to get to an orgasm as we know it, this climax type of an orgasm, when it's an explosion, you have to build up, build up, build up the pleasure, push it into genitals area, and then you have to tense for that thing to explode. If you take away that moment of tension, there will be no explosion. So relax consciously throughout the lovemaking, and that will automatically kind of bring you to driving that wave, okay? Now, I would say, will this be frustrating at the beginning? Probably. And I'm just going to bring uh, the example of my recent lover. And I remember the first two times when he got about to a seven and maybe an eight. And I was like, nope, we're going to slow down. He was definitely frustrated for a couple of times. But then the third time we met and he absolutely learned to enjoy riding that wave. And what's important for men, especially to ride this wave, is that you have to come at, to peace with the possibility of losing erection, okay? We are so obsessed uh, on, you know, the penis being hard, big, and erected all the time that a lot of men don't, are afraid of the wave because they're afraid that they, if they're gonna go back to a four from an eight, they're gonna lose an erection, right? And maybe sometimes they will, but then often they will get it back. And either way, it's okay. So once we all, and actually women also get to get uh, in peace that a man loses erection and it's not their fault and they're not less off and this and that, right? So if we all relax about that, we can start enjoying riding the wave. And then from that moment, we will be able to kind of start having those, those energetic orgasms. I love that so much because there is so much pressure for men to stay hard. And then also woman, if a, if a guy gets soft, it's like, what's wrong with me? Am I not attractive? Are you bored? Do you not like this? And then that can Absolutely. create issues in your relationship. And I think the other side happens too, of sometimes when you slow down, the woman dries up and she's like mm -hmm. no longer into it or wants to go on to the next thing. So what is your advice to keep people like 
focused and in the container when like, sometimes I feel like a disinterest can happen when you're like going to peak and you don't have the orgasm and you slow down that like, sometimes you're mm-hmm. just sort of, you sort of are like over it. <laughs> <laughs> so what I would say again, I probably don't go so close to the peak. So there is not like a sudden drop to me. To me, Sahara, it's more like a dance. A dance meets meditation, meets conversation, meets communion, meets pleasure. And it's all wrapped up into this beautiful dance of the bodies. So I sometimes pause and we share and we ask, hey, what do you feel? Uh, What sensations in the body? And then we slowly touch each other again. And then we talk and then we come back to it. And then we move and... With to me again, it's it's more it's more a state of flow, um, going away with expectations, and maybe not such a drastic move be- between eight and two, but more of a just stay all the time at a six or a five, and again, no expectation and practice that will just you know be- become you will become more skillful in that, and it will become more natural and easy. Mm, that's so good. And such a beautiful explanation. I feel like such a powerful connector between two people. And if more couples had that kind of, you know, just intimacy, true intimacy, Mm -hmm. that's beyond like, oh, we had sex this week. So like, we're good versus like that conversation and asking each other, how you feel in your body and letting it be this beautiful romance. It's just such a powerful bond creator. And yeah, I feel like in general, so many of us were so used to finishing things with a short amount of time, right? So I think time is one of the things that blocks us from really letting ourselves do that because when it's on the back of our mind of like, okay, I only have 20 minutes or, oh, I need Mm -hmm. to be doing this next. Um, So how much time should we be carving out for this type of thing? That's a great question. And you know, again, I'm going to bring this lover because it's, it resonates with a lot of questions. <clears throat> I remember when I told him and many people, when I tell them that I make love for two, three, four hours and was like, what do you even do number one and why and who has time for this? And that was similarly the case with the recent lover. And once we were making love and I asked him, hey, do you want to look at the clock? Do you realize how long we've been here? Four hours. <laughs> And I was, do you want to go for dinner? And he says, no, I want to continue. So I would say for self-pleasure practice, uh, at least one hour. And when you're with a partner, at least two hours. Okay. Now, when you think of it, okay, who has time for this? I want you to think of this as a different type of an experience. So it's kind of lovemaking meets intimacy and connecting deeply with your partner meets spiritual practice, meets your yoga and massage practice, and it's relaxing, and it's uplifting, and it's nourishing, and it's healing, and it's all of those things. And it's essentially going to make you feel energized, inspired, creative, radiant, and those benefits are just, you know, so much more than when you look at the number, the the time that you invest into that and there is so and I can again I received so many letters from women telling me oh my god I became so much more radiant so much more confident then our sexual energy when channeled upwards becomes from energy of creation goes into the energy of creativity so your ideas the way and I actually love you know a, a book uh, stealing fire talks a lot about that we really go into higher states of consciousness when we have those prolonged love making sessions and those higher states of consciousness are not just magical in the moment we experience them but they do create new neuropaths right so we can see our awareness expands we can see things from a different angle we become more creative we become super uh, superhumans or supernatural like Joe Dispenza would say that right so there is just so much magic to that and in, and it's last but not least something that we have at our disposal within our body so let's tap into this inner source of power right 
that is available to us at any time, that is free, that doesn't have any side effects, that only can make, it, make us expand and grow and so and so on. So what a better thing to spend your time on than doing that. And imagine that on top of it, you can actually share it with your partner on a deep soul level. So what better do we have to do? I'm going to ask everyone, where are you rushing off to? What mm. sounds more magical than this? I agree. It's reprioritizing what matters to us. And if I said every week with your partner, watch a movie, a movie's like two and a half hours long. You'd be like, okay, I could watch it, but we already watched way more than one movie. Or if I said every month, watch one movie or watch two hours of television or go on Instagram for two hours, you'd be like, I do, mm -hmm. do way more than that. But if I say every month, make love for two hours, it's, oh my mm -hmm. God, I don't have the time for that. So it just shows what we prioritize. And as a society, like we just prioritize output. So productivity and getting things done that we will spend time on or numbing. But Absolutely. the real reason why we're doing either of those things is to experience pleasure. So let's just skip the middle man and go, <laughs> go straight for the pleasure. And I actually think we do dedicate a lot of time to experience pleasure, but we learn that we need to outsource pleasure. And that's also what we're sold, right? We need to get sugar. We need to go shopping. We need all things external to experience pleasure, right? But it's in there. It requires more time. It requires intention. It requires practice. Uh, so, you know, many people don't want to do it, but it's much more powerful mm -hmm. and healthy and sustainable. And I think too, it gives our brains a chance to slow down. Cause I know for me, like at the end of the day, I'm like, I create content. So my head is like spinning with like more content, more content. Like I want to listen to a podcast. Mm -hmm. I want to listen to a course. I want to listen to an audio book that almost when I stop, I'm like, I feel like I'm not doing enough or I'm falling behind. I need to always be like listening to someone talk and what this gives us a, a and whether it's by yourself, just taking a bath and, or putting a feather on your body, it just gives your brain a chance to slow down and for you to actually integrate and feel all of the things that we honestly are escaping by constantly making ourselves busy or filling up our minds with other people's thoughts. Absolutely. And listen, obviously I have similar challenges and I'm busy and my business is growing and million things are happening. That's why I'm a big advocate of scheduling, uh, self-pleasure and lovemaking in the calendar. So it's really there. Like anything else that is important for you, schedule that as well. Mm, love that so much. And we're so excited to dive deeper with you into energetic love making in Rose Gold Goddesses this February for Valentine's Day. Such a great treat to dive in even deeper into this work. So thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us and where can listeners connect with you and learn from you even further? Yeah, thank you for having me. Great pleasure. Um, I have a difficult Polish name, so that always brings additional challenges. That's why I, my Instagram handle is a little bit more fun and creative, and it's Planet BB, which is Planet B-I-B-I. -B -I, so that's my favorite social media channel. Otherwise, you can also find me uh, my website. And because of the difficult name, I also had an additional URL, which is energeticlovemaking.com. And that will redirect you to my Polish surname and domain. <laughs> Amazing. And we'll have those links in the show notes. Thank you again so much for sharing your wisdom with us today. Thank you. And everyone listening, have an orgasmic week. And I would love you to take notes of at least two things you're taking away from this podcast that you are committing to implementing. That would be a beautiful uh, seed that both me and Sahara can plant here. Yes, and share them on your Instagram stories so we can see them and reshare them so we can see each other's takeaways. That'll be a fun way to spread those seedlings along. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you, Sahara. Lots of love. <laughs>